Eric Young with Talking Point Radio. Yes, we are having a show today. We're starting a little bit late. Today's show, we're talking about the race card at Dixie State University with the special guests joining us. Uh, come back and join us after the break. Do you want more say in your college radio station? Be the assistant program director for 91 Through the Storm. You can go to 91throughthestorm.com, visit our Facebook page, or our Twitter account and give us your opinion on what we should and shouldn't play. Tell us what to do, and you can be the assistant program director for 91 Through the Storm. DJ KC, make sure to stay tuned. Welcome to Talking Point. It's the talk you avoid at the dinner table, but it's the topics that blow up on Facebook. Join the conversation on Twitter and Facebook at Talking Point SUL. Now your hosts for Talking Point, Jennifer Kohler and Eric Young. Welcome back. Eric Young here with you. Jennifer Kohler. My co-host. We have a couple of studio guests today as we talk about race at Dixie State University. Uh, Tia Matthews and Morgan Kirk here are going to join our conversation that we'll have for the next 40 minutes or so. A um, little bit of background. I ran into Tia the first time when uh, I judged her at a speech to entertain competition that we had, uh, what was that, last year? It was last... Uh, I can't I remember which spring. semester. Was it spring, spring semester? I think yeah. it was two. Because we're in fall now. We are in fall now. Thank you for that reminder. And uh, Tia gave, uh, you won that, didn't you? Did you win that? Uh, second place, actually. Second place. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, no, I judged you, but I want you to know it had nothing to do with you coming in second, just so I'll, you're aware. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> Mostly. But Tia gave a, uh, a speech to entertain that uh, looked at what it's like to be both a female and a black female uh, here uh, in St. George's culture here at Dixie State University. Was that, is that uh, relatively accurate, even close? Yeah, I just pretty much for the speech entertained poked fun at like the racial issues that I faced okay. and all that stuff. So I've, I've asked you to come back in here and, and give us the speech. Let's, can you, let's start with that. The, the whole speech, the whole, oh man. Nothing but the whole it speech. It was just stories of my blunders here in Dixie. I, one of the stories I told in my speech was of how I went to Target freshman year with my roommate, and um, we were just getting stuff from Target, you know, because Target has those, all those commercials of stuff you need in your dorms, blah, blah, blah. And we're just shopping around and getting stuff. And my, my roommate as well was, was black, or is black, I guess. And uh, <laughs> we were just shopping around, and we finally checked out online, and this cute, cute little girl, blue eyes, blonde hair, you know, just cooing at us and making faces and stuff. And um, she got dead silent for a minute and just looked right at us. And she kind of looked at her mom, and she looked back at us. And she points, and she goes, Mommy, chocolate, pointing dead at us. And that was how I knew I wasn't in Vegas anymore, and this is going to be a, definitely a different experience. And then um, one of my second experiences out here was at Costco, and I saw these uh, group of people who dressed fairly, fairly conservative with long dresses and the dark shoes and they had their hair in these really high braids and I kept thinking to myself this is like a National Geographic special or is this TLC or is this, are they real people they're a, they're a group of polygamists I've never seen any in Vegas yeah, for, they're polygamous wives just, yeah, sorry. just for clarification polygamous that way. wives and I was like wow and they had their kids with them it's a trail of kids with them and it was like a war in there just all five six ten of them hanging out together I was like, wow, this is this is real. I'm definitely in Utah, and it just kind of blew my mind, things like that. So, yeah, that was, I guess, the abundance of my speech, just how different it was being from one place to another and things that just kind of opened my eyes, I guess. Now, we would expect a little bit of culture shock coming from anywhere to here, to St. George, in that respect. So you came here from Vegas, is that yep. right? And you're born and raised? Born and raised. In that respect. Um <laughs> I'm almost wanting to ask you that uh, question, the the one that other people ask you as far as, so what's it like to being, be? I guess being out here in, in Utah? Or, <laughs> or is, is the question being black in Utah? Is yeah, that what the question is being black in Utah or black in St. George or black at Dixie State University. Um, I guess you could say I'm reminded of it very often with a few stares from people occasionally or I guess not occasionally more often than not um mostly well one I see it mostly in children children are you know innocent little ones that they are they are going to stare because it's different 
and it's, it comes from mixed children, um, white children, all children. They give you the looks of who are you or what are you or whatever. And then you get it from people who just are from smaller towns, you know. I've talked to one student around here who said they didn't have a, a black kid in their class until they actually came to Dixie. So I was like, oh, okay, that's that's weird, I guess, given that I've been in classes with blacks, Mexicans, Asians, whatever, you know, diversity form you've came from. I've had a class with somebody like that. So to, there, to be kids that actually have had classes with no other races, that just kind of blew my mind. So well, That's pretty monocultural in that respect from a race standpoint, certainly here. Um, but we all have access to media and, and uh, probably too much access and, and too many stereotypes that are perpetuated by that. Have you, um, have you been held to any stereotypes along those lines? I wouldn't say a stereotype necessarily, but more of a, you're different than I expected. It's like, well, what did you expect from me? You know, you're not like other black people. I'm like, what are other black people like? I'm, I'm black. What do you mean I'm not like something else? I guess uh, if you want to call that a stereotype or a defiance against one, I've gotten that one very yeah, often. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it is. There. Um, not only uh, are you black and female, you came here to play a sport mm-hmm. originally that way. There's a stereotype that goes along with that as well. Um, <laughs> I'm digging here. You need to give me something back. <laughs> <laughs> um, what stereotype would you like from that one? Well, there's a black athlete stereotype. There's the black female athlete stereotype. There's the there's, student athlete stereotype. And yeah. Uh, we can go on and on and on that way. What the black athlete stereotype, that one, I just happen to be 6'2 and fairly athletic, so I don't think there's too many stereotypes there. But if you do watch the WNBA, some of the best teams do have, you know, a lot of athletic black people. But it's not saying it's because of race. It's, you know, just because of circumstances, you know. Why not just play sports when you're young and – get into things like that so sports and sports excellence has nothing to do with your race at all well so, you, you know that and i know that yeah. but we have people that actually believe that i mean that's that really is just their opinions but it's a joke it's a stereotype because i know plenty of black kids who are unathletic or whatever and i know white kids who are athletic if you look at some of the nfl's and uh, quarterbacks in the nfl some of the best quarterbacks are white so is this a non-issue then, or why are we having this show today? <laughs> to answer that completely, I guess, it would be to address the the fact of how many microaggressions and ignorances we come across, I guess, to get into specifics. Okay. Let's define, that's an interesting term I, I'm not familiar with, microaggressions. So let's talk about what do, what are we saying when, when we use that term? It's It's little tidbits of racism, I guess, that you're accustomed to doing that you don't even know about. Okay. So uh, what are some examples that come to mind, perhaps? Just daily questions, I guess, that you would get. I've heard the question more than anything, can I touch your hair, more times than I can count. If I, I told Eric one time, if I had a penny for every time I've asked that question, I would be a billionaire from pennies. So your hair is kind of, I'm looking at it now, it's kind of fuzzy and black. And black. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so would wanting to, would would that be a racist comment or a comment about your hair? Well, do you get asked for people to touch your hair? No, my hair is just very boring. So what's so exciting about my hair? It could be that it would be different well, from def- what somebody. Define different, though. Well, like my hair, I'm like white middle-aged lady, and so I, my hair would be typical. But your hair might be different for this environment. They're by being a cause of curiosity, not related to race, but just related to being different. Is that possible? It is possible, but for the simple fact that I am black makes it an issue of race. Okay, that's a good point because one of my questions that I wanted to ask, I had a couple of questions and here's one of them. You've heard the phrase, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? Mm -hmm. What if you substituted the word racism is in the eye of the beholder. Let's c- explore that possibility. Do you so, think that could be a valid question to ask? Is that from what I got from that question is yeah. racism can be justified based on how you look at it. If you substitute it, racism is in the eye of the beholder. Well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't get justified. I'm just saying even exists. So, what could it be possible that sometimes that could be true? Do you think? Well, the fact that it's it's 
here's where I come back to microaggressions. The okay. fact that that question gets asked, it can be not considered racist, I guess. It's just okay. a microaggression. It's become a custom. It's a thing that I've gotten used to now. But aggression, okay, when we use the term aggression, we're talking about somebody asserting their rights and getting their way at the expense, right, of somebody else. So doing a behavior that is harmful in some way of blocking somebody else or trampling their rights. That's an aggressive action, right? Well, this is where the word micro comes into play. Okay. You're not completely physically harming me. You're just reminding me that I'm different from you anytime okay. you reach out to touch and ask about my hair. Okay, so different, is that good or bad? Well, it depends. I mean, if it's if it's different for educational purposes, well, then sure, it's it's good. But if it's different for your own, I guess, curiosity, like, oh, I've never seen that or I want to explore this, then it could be bad. Is it a difference between ignorance and naivety? Very much so. Okay. So is ignorance bad? Yes, ignorance is bad. Really? I would say well, so. Well, aren't we all born ignorant into the world and lacking knowledge in the subject? Well, maybe we need to define what ignorant means. Yeah. So let's define what we mean. So <laughs> ignorant means you don't know something, right? Or maybe you've chosen not to know something. Well, that would be willful ignorance. Okay. But ignorance by itself means just not knowing. Ignorant of a fact or mm -hmm. a situation, right? Not knowing. So we could say ignorance has a moral value to it, being good or bad. Or we could just say it is or it isn't. We could say it doesn't have a moral a moral dimension to it, not knowing. What do you think? I'd say at this day and age, ignorance can be pretty much depleted. If you're curious about something, you can just Google anything, you know? Mm -hmm. If you want to know how much Eric Young makes a year, you can just Google it. You don't I have would to go, like to know that. Oh. Well, you'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go up to him and say, hey, you're a professor. How much money are you making? You don't have to be so blunt about it. Only because I'm a state employee and then it's public record. But yeah, okay. uh, only because Otherwise, you'd have to search a little. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so you're saying it's not excusable in this day and age. Anybody wants to be informed, they can be informed. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. I mean, if there's people and in by third choosing world countries not that can figure out stuff, then so can you. Okay. <laughs> Very good point. By choosing not to be informed, that's what I would define perhaps as ignorant. Mm -hmm. And so then to turn around around rat to turn that around and say, oh, can I can I touch your hair? You're, I've never seen black hair. Okay, before. so if I want to get informed on how your hair feels, why do you need to know how her hair feels? Because I'm curious. I don't want to be ignorant on how it feels. <laughs> so what makes you curious about it what? though? Is well, the fact that it's different? I or? want to be informed. I don't want to be ignorant, so I'm curious, and so then I do things to inform myself, right? In a sense, yes. Okay, so curiosity is, you know, there's ignorance. We said, I don't know if we decided if it's good or bad. Do we say it's morally neutral? Well, and let's, just, yeah. I, I'm not sure about the moral neutrality here, okay. what we're getting into. I think the point here, as far as microaggression is concerned, is, is asking questions that have an inherent racial idea to them. Like my hesitating even asked to you, so what's it like for you to be black? Because I know she's been asked that before. And that is a microaggression. The question itself goes through and says, what's it like to be different where what's you it, are? Exactly. It, and, it, and it pinpoints her, it pulls her out of, uh, out of a group and says, oh my gosh, you're black. So what's that like? Well, I, yeah, I can yeah. probably figure that out other ways to go through and, and define that. There's plenty of media around there. There's, there's plenty of, uh, of uh, there's plenty of film. Uh, I'm liking the word to get to, but there's plenty for me to go through and, and understand that. And you know what? By and, and for the record, in full transparency, I'm white. This is a radio show to put that out there. So um, that being the case, it's it's relatively impossible for me to understand what that's like, okay, to be black. Right. To, to, so what's the point of the question? Well, what's the point of, can I touch your hair? I, because this isn't a zoo we live in. The, this isn't a okay, place where we know, look at I, differences I, and go through and say, wow, you're, I'm, I want to explore your difference. Okay, all I'm saying is you, you can if you take that, that line of reasoning, then what you're saying to me is if you want to be – if you don't want to be ignorant, you have to get information. But now I have to be really careful about how I get my information. I have to get it secondhand. I, I'm not allowed to ask somebody. Well, I think there's just a different way to ask it. It's, it's a matter okay. of you getting informed by invading my personal space. By asking a question about what your life is like? No, by asking what something on me feels like. 
is that, if that makes sense at all. You get informed by inform by disturbing my personal bubble. Oh, it's a matter of okay. that. Okay, it's a you can go from oh your hair is nice. How long did it take to braid it? I'll ask. I'll answer that easily. Oh, my hair takes you know this many plus hours. I do this. I do this. I do this. And then the moment you come over and try to reach, especially if I don't know you, and say, Oh, you mean without asking permission? Yes, not happy. This person asked though. Can I can I touch your hair? They yeah, ask permission. Yeah. Th- You'd be surprised more often than how many people ask versus who do not ask. So well, typically, you would, you would explain to me the other day. You you get the point, you the get, reach. You get the point, the reach. There's a sequence that you know someone's going to reach out and try to touch your hair. I mean, am I am I wrong, Lord? Yeah, I I've seen it too. Sorry, too many times to where a lot of people go and just automatically like just touch the hair and put their hands in it and touching the scalp and just really just grasping onto it without even asking. That's they just, just got to freak you out. It, it does freak me out because, I mean, I don't have braids. So it's just like I've never been through that. But still, it's just like why would you even go that extra route without even asking or just you could just look at it. It's okay. Like, you're up close enough to see, like, okay, yeah, it's braids. You've never seen it before, but it's something different, like she said, but you don't have to go and put your hand into it. A, we don't know where your hand, what you've been doing all day. <laughs> so now they have to go wash their hair. So I'm really curious. So so has that happened to you then? No, it, yeah. it's never happened to okay. me. Okay, I've never... What age group of people goes around sticking their hands in other all people's hair without asking... All little them, kids. Them, yeah. How kids, about like kids your women, age? Elders. People, um, really? Yeah. Not. I mean, I've seen it's bizarre. Like a handful. It is bizarre. Of our but, age. I mean, has anybody wanted to touch your hair, Jan? Um, let's see. My granddaughter actually. She is three. Well, she that's always that's a little kid. I mean, to touch my, <laughs> my, my hair. To touch my hair. I mean, that's, I am, that's I'm okay. 19 days into no shave November, and <laughs> no one has wanted to yet touch my beard. Unfortunately, hmm. when I had my head shaved, nobody wanted to touch my. Would you be offended if I asked, or if somebody asked, "Can I fill your beard?" Well, <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Sean. Sean Denniman's to... coming in to touch my He's beard. Trying to no, would you be a... me out? Would so, you be offended? Yes, I am now. Anxiety right there's my life. He just tried to touch your beard without asking. I want to touch his beard. I mean, if everyone wants to touch it. Oh, we're really getting off base here. <laughs> I don't think My so. My point is, if I, they did that just because I was a white guy, I'd go. <laughs> but how do you know if that's why they're asking? Well, that's the only thing that's different between it. That, that's between the texture is. and my color. Those are the two only reasons why you would want to touch my hair. Very true. There's no other reason other than that. Not the length, not the color, not the style. It's the texture and my race. <laughs> At the end of the day, when you set, sort facts out, that's it right there. What other types of microaggressions are we talking about? There's a million of them. I mean, where do we? So you're start. not like all other black women. Yeah, you're not. You're not like those kind of black women. Like, right? uh, I I hate like you're not those type of black people where a lot of people see that stereotype where black people are loud and and aggressive and always like to fight and you know use guns and drugs and just. And eat fried chicken. That's that's the main one that I always get. Like, go, oh, you like fried chicken and watermelon? It's just... Is that, from, does... is that from television, do you think? No, it's from people. I, I actually came... I read about that. I came from a... Uh, uh, I can't remember the author's name, but it came back from when blackface was really big and ignorant and all that stuff. The watermelon and fried chicken actually developed from that. So, so that was you, in the movies, probably. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. So when people you in the poke stage. fun at that, you're actually reaching way back to something bigger than you. Okay. Well, the stereotype certainly perpetuated through media, but yeah. we have other ways to go through and put that out there. When, when uh, Tiger Woods won the first U.S. Open, um, another golfer, another pro by the name of Fuzzy Zeller was interviewed and asked, you know, what kind of of an effect will this have on the PGA? And he goes, well, I guess we'll be serving watermelon and fried chicken at the banquet tonight. So he he got that notion either from firsthand experience with people he knew, which is probably not true, or he got it from the media. No, no, I I would have to disagree there. I, I grew up in a in a relatively bigoted environment. East Bay, California, Oakland. My father, white, worked in uh, in downtown Oakland, and uh, he had his <laughs> his moments of bigotry. The N-word flew around my house without any um, censor at all in that respect. And uh, 
he didn't just get that from watching Archie Bunker on All in the Family. Where'd he get it? Really? Yeah. He got I'm it serious. from the people he works with. He, he, he get, got it from his siblings. Where did they get it from? Did they invent that idea? No, they got it through the media. I will go and say racism is definitely a learned trait. It's a, yeah. It is a learned It's being trait. taught to us somehow. But not, it's not, not just the media. media. Not from the media at all. It's, okay. it's, taught through, it's taught through your environment, to people you hang out with, it's people you associate with. That's where racism is taught from. It's learned. It starts was, in yeah. the family. I was it's talking a, to Eric first. I said, I'm sure there's plenty of kids around campus whose grandparents are blatant racist. You know, maybe not their parents, but grandparents, great grandparents, all that, that line far back. And if not, well, you know, kudos to your family. You're one of few. I guess what I'm saying is families are made up of people. People get ideas from somewhere. They either get them from firsthand experience. Usually those are more accurate, right, than being secondhand experience. Or they get them from the media. But they get them from somewhere. Uh, Families don't come up and invent. So are you like, saying somewhere it's back then someone decided that all black people, because they witnessed this firsthand, like watermelon and fried chicken? No, That's what I'm getting from what you just said. No, what I'm trying to say is in the media, and it started from probably, we can probably pinpoint the movies, the exact name of the movie, directed by so-and-so, produced by so-and-so. I promise but, you the N-word did not originate in the media. Well, then that is... Okay, so where did that word come from? Where do you think it came from? It didn't come from me. I'm asking the question seriously. Where did it come from? The bigots of back in those days. I feel like it came from, like, slavery. I mean, if you want to go all the way back. So the way people really learned these things is from their grandfather, and so their grandfather brought it down to their son, and the son, it just it's a chain reaction to where that's all they learn and that's all they know to go by. So they don't know a different way to not say that word or to not look at African-Americans saying that they like fried chicken and watermelon. It's just like a, it's a common thing for him, for them. They don't know how to get out of that, I feel like. Okay, so we can, we can control a little bit of our environment. We can impact it a little bit. And I would say the media has been a culprit, but it could also be a force for counteracting that, you know, putting a different point of view out there and correcting it, couldn't it? And are there medias that we can look to that we can say, oh, that's a force against bigotry and racism? There's plenty of forces against it, but the majority still is. It's still going to be second place to it. For the record, the the earliest iteration of the N-word goes back to 1619 uh, by a gentleman by the name of John Rolfe who used a, a derogative of that term in describing African-American slaves who were shipped to a Virginia colony. In print, do you think, or just does it say anything more about the use of the word if it was printed in like a oh, newspaper? Oh, I get, I get later. It doesn't say how yeah. he used the word. Yeah. I would imagine it was it might have been on a handbill or something. Wolf was uh, one of the first early English settlers, settlers of North America, credited with the first successful cultivation of tobacco. I'm getting this off of his biography. Okay. But, yeah, it didn't say what's going on there speaking of wolf there's a movie if you haven't seen it called traces of the trade stories from the deep north it's a documentary made by katrina brown and she's a white chick from up north kind of ivy league upper elite aristocracy and she discovered that her ancestors were the dewolf family and they were the largest slave trading family in the united states when she discovered that she was mortified and so she made a documentary with 22 other members of her family, and they went to Africa and to the Caribbean, and they traced the triangle of the slave trade, investigating the past of their ancestors and the impact on their country. And I think it's a very profound documentation of the slave trade in the United States and would be good information really for any, anybody to look at. I highly recommend it. You're listening to Talking Point Radio. Our hashtag today is TP Race Card. Hashtag TP Race Card. For those of you who want to join the conversation on Twitter, you can also join our Facebook page as well at facebook.com slash talking point S-U-L. You could uh, join the conversation there. We're going to take a little break, and we'll be right back. Uh, you're listening to Talking Point Radio here at uh, The Storm. 
Today's topic, we're talking about uh, the race card here at Dixie State University. I'm Eric Young with my co-host Jennifer Kohler. We have two studio guests with us today. We have Tia Matthews and Morgan Kirk, and we're talking about uh, microaggressions, um, subtle implications of uh, comments that might be uh, racially charged. But I want to go to a, a bigger picture here as we, uh, as we talk about uh, what's going on. Uh, New York University, a number of universities have had this campaign, the I2MNYU, where they have students uh, from other race, racial backgrounds, other ethnicities, um, who are holding up a placard of some sort that says, uh, that debunks perhaps a stereotypical myth about that individual that way. For example, um, our last show, when we were talking about uh, the dreaded Thanksgiving conversations, we had in our a guest, um, Hiram. I had to go through Joseph Smith's family and remember his name. We had Hiram who joined us. Hiram happens to be Polynesian. And he talked about when he first met his uh, future in-laws, when he showed up there, they thought he was there to mow their lawn. Oh, oh he's a little the, kid. He, he was, what'd you say? The, the younger brother thought that. The, the younger brother thought that, mm -hmm. uh, despite that association there. When uh, w when Obama took office the first time, there was this n incredibly naive notion that this was it for racism in America. It's over with now that we have a black president. T and I were talking a little earlier today about that, and I asked her, you know, "Are we getting are we getting better, or or are we getting worse when it comes to even the idea of racism?" Morgan, you're you're shaking your head. What do you think? I honestly, I feel like it's the same. I feel like nothing has changed. I feel like that it it has become, racism has become even more worse than what it was before, even before he has even taken office. So I feel like it's, it's I, I'm just shaking my head on it. It's just. Is that be, because? We have a black president, and that opens up. Is it the social media maybe exacerbate um, that? Is what's happening in Ferguson? Yeah, I was I was going to gonna bring that up. Also, I I I feel like these police officers have ever since the Ferguson incident has happened. I feel like these police officers can pretty much do whatever they want to do now. I feel like if they see a, a African American just walking down the street and they think they have done something, and then just you know, boom, they're dead by a police officer. It's just they, they are taking that extra route to even put their hand on their gun and shoot one of us. I, 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 it's just it's just too much to even go into. I feel like just go ahead to you. When it, if we talk cops and race, the event of driving while black, that is real. That was my next question to you. That is real. Driving while black. Have you been pulled over while driving while actually, black? Yes, actually. Last year I had I had this little old beater car, and whenever I drive home from work, um, I mean, you know, it's a simple car. Nothing fancy, fantastic about it. I would just be driving down the street listening to my music. Nothing that you would steal, in other nothing, words. Nothing right. to do steal. I would okay. probably pay someone to steal it. That's how <laughs> much of a beater Is that was. here in St. George? Yeah. Uh -huh. I had this little beater car, and usually driving home from work, a cop would follow me home. Just uh, out of curiosity, there's nothing special about my car. It's a it's a grandma car. It was a '85 Buick. It was Maybe old. he just wanted to touch your hair. Maybe he just wanted to touch my hair. But driving while black is a real thing, because I would drive home with friends after work sometimes. Same street, same cop park there. Nothing, but me. Yep, driving down the street. Oh yeah, there it is. I get pulled over more times in that car than ever in my life. I never got a ticket. It was always just a one of those curiosity checks or make up a. A BS reason to pull me over. You didn't have a bumper sticker that said legalize marijuana. None of that. None of that. Or one time I was like, uh, "Oh, your your blinker wasn't on." It was on because I saw it up here, and I definitely saw it in my rearview mirror okay. blinking as well. Right. You just wanted to run my name and see who I am, twice in the same week. So, driving while black is real. Uh, more often than not, it happens to guys though. I'm, I'm sure if we had a guy in here, he'd probably have double my number. Yeah, I extended an invitation to a, a number of students that way, but uh, have the, the football practice is going on and, and study time and all that kind of stuff. So here we are as it goes. Morgan, any experience that way? with? Uh... Um, I've never had experience that type of way at all. Um, yeah, Tia's car was really, 
one Those of those cars. Cool. I mean, hey. yeah, no, not that fancy. But I've I've never had that experience. I've had plenty. I have other experiences. You know, going to a store and someone thinks I'm stealing, and I'm I haven't stolen anything. I'm just trying to go in there and shop. But you know, there's been multiple times as people will stop and have other people just follow you around the store for what reason i'm not doing anything i don't look suspicious i'm just shopping i'm trying to give you guys money but it's it's makes me uncomfortable so then i leave you it's too many you could probably take a survey of 10 10 black kids and nine of them would probably say they've been followed around the store on any given occasion for no reason you can always tell it's never really subtle it's like oh this guy's been following us for three aisles now and he keeps hiding around corners. And, yeah, he thinks we're stealing. So at, at what point do we say we are playing the race card? <laughs> or is that even a legitimate comment to make? Let, let me put some context to this. I told you the story before. Um, I attended Southern Utah State College, SUU, back when it was before it was a university. A close friend of mine was, uh, and his name is Jamie, and Jamie was black. And we're in February, freezing up there walking across campus and uh, first of February they were hanging a banner on the student union building that said Black Awareness Month and I turned to Jamie and I said my gosh Jamie you're black and he just kind of laughed it off and shook his head and he goes why do we have to do that where's the happy middle ground here from going through and looking at the differences and appreciating the differences and then also looking at the similarities and appreciating the similarities because it seems on one extreme or the other we're going to run into stereotypes and we're going to run into judgments and we're going to run into this uh, like we're talking about as far as these uh, microaggressions are concerned what do you think yeah is there a happy medium is that what you're asking is there a place where I think that that's going to be culturally derived, okay, because a happy medium here and a happy medium in Vegas are going to be two different things. And a happy medium in Oakland and one in Detroit are going to be two different things there as well. There, So we can't ignore what kinds of conversations already exist and, and what we do about those. But do we fan the flames of racism? It certainly happens a lot, I think. By being ultra-sensitive? Hyper-vigilant, ultra-sensitive. Well, let me, let me just say, that's where my concern lies. And part of the conversation is that it's, it's important to point out when, when we're being unfair to one another and when we're being unkind to one another and when we're, when we're perpe- you know, perpetrating a microaggression, for example. But what we need, though, is a common denominator there because you might not know that you are being offensive well, let me with give a you comment an, like, yeah, let me give you an example hair. of UNLV when I was a student there a few years ago and I was in the library on the campus and just kind of in my own head thinking about whatever I was thinking about and the door started to close and this young guy jumped in there you know kind of wedged in just before the door completely closed and then he said something to me like that I didn't hold the door open for him because he was black and I'm like well, first of all, I didn't even know anybody was trying to get into the elevator. I was, you know, in my own head, in my own world. And then you popped in there. And then you say this to me. And I'm like, what the heck? I'm, you know, didn't see anybody out there. So he's operating under some kind of assumption that you didn't hold the door open for yeah, him because he's like blind. I was maybe doing a microaggression when I just wasn't doing anything. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's the thing that makes me concerned is that... We have to identify it when it happens, and we have to say, that's not appropriate. That's not appropriate in our society, in our culture, to treat people poorly. But we also got to be careful that we don't see it happening if it's not happening, right? That we don't take offense when no offense is intended. Because, man, we'll be running around being unhappy with each other unnecessarily. You know, when... People like each other, they'll be misconstrued as being obnoxious or ignorant or offensive when they mean no offense by it. That's the tricky part. You don't have control over that. Yeah. I would say that that character in the elevator that day, he's probably 
been discriminated enough he to has. where that's where he finally assumed. He has. Know? Yeah, if absolutely. I'm, if, I, if you grew up in a very racist place and then something like that happens, you're going to assume just because it's there because that's yeah. what you're used to. Yeah, and I, I was not offended by him being offended by me. I figure that was his reality, but I felt badly that he thought I was intentional. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I could have been offended. You know, I could have said, well, who do you think you are, you know, accusing me of being a racist when I'm just standing here in the elevator? But I figured, like you just said, he had some reasons from past experience to feel that way. So he was offended. I wasn't in that situation. Well, that, so, uh, that defines this, this concept of white privilege, and that's the reason why I can't stand here and say, well, I know what it's like to be a black person, because I have no idea. Uh, nor, after many of stories that I've listened to by many students, do I want to ever experience what they've gone through. Um, I tried a little experiment a number of years ago in an interpersonal class that was too full of students. And uh, to, to thin them out a bit, I, I didn't... Uh, you got rid of students on purpose? I did, because oh it, was, it was too full. And there were too many people having ad cards to get in, in into there. We're almost out of time. Let me quicken the story here. So I feigned that I was a homosexual. I had a diamond magnetic stud earring I put in my right ear. I walked in. I talked a little bit more effeminately than usual. And uh, within moments, I had people leaving the class. Okay? Going away. And uh, I thought it had worked. Uh, unfortunately, those leaving the class were the ones who actually needed to have the class, if you understand what I'm saying as far as their own, their oh, own yes. bigotry in that respect. The following Sunday, I'm coming uh, back from my favorite store. It was Lowe's or, or Home Depot. And I was pulled up at a, at a stoplight, and I was driving a Miata as well. And uh, this big truck pulls up behind me. And all I can see in my rearview mirror is the differential case from the front. Of the, I mean, it's really jacked up, right? And these guys are saying, you effing homo. You, you know, all kinds of, um, of homosexual epithets are being lauded at me. And I, uh, for a moment, a very brief moment, I knew what it was like to be, uh, I hesitate to even say this because I don't want to offend anybody, but for 30 seconds I knew what it was like to be an outed homosexual in mm -hmm. St. George. I, mm -hmm. can't, I can only imagine what it would be like to be black in this area. And we've mm -hmm. come some distance we haven't had a cross burning here in St. George since 1998, to the best of my knowledge, okay? We, which we did here Ew. in 1998. So we, we've, we've come a ways, and certainly I think yeah. Dixie State University has something to do with that in making hopefully a safe place for more diversity uh, to thrive here uh, in an educational environment. Um, we're getting close to having to wrap this up. I'm curious uh, with both Tia and, uh, and Morgan what your thoughts are here. As, as far as Dixie State's own culture is concerned, mm -hmm. is, is, this a, is this something we still run at the flagpole? Or, or, or how can we get better? I feel as though the way we can get better is just start, start ac accepting everyone as who they are. Because let's say, you know, we get more African-Americans fall semester. Next, the spring semester, you barely won't see any because of the environment, the climate that we have on campus is where they start to leave because a they don't feel uncomfortable they they feel as though this is not the place for me so they, they feel uncomfortable is yes that what you, uncomfortable okay. you said yeah. they don't feel uncomfortable oh sorry so, okay. they don't feel uncomfortable they don't feel um, comfortable <laughs> they um they also feel as though there's not that many of us on here there's no one for them to turn to right. when they need someone so yeah we do have a black student union on campus but there's not that many that of, of us to come together and become a union. So I feel as though we all need to accept either African Americans, Mexicans, you know, Asians. It doesn't matter what race you are. It's just the acceptance that we do need on campus. I feel that will that will make us much better as a university. Tia? I've also heard, I guess everyone of a different race has heard that you have to work twice as hard to get half of what they have. And if you know what that means, it means being of a different race, you have to work twice as hard as someone who's white to get half of what they want. Like being on campus, I have to not only prove to you that I'm not one of those black people, but I have to also prove to you that I'm educated, that I deserve to be in college. There's a you know, few teachers here on campus who will probably, I walk into a room that can be like, oh, another black kid, or it can be, oh, wow, this girl's educator, or whatever. It's just, I have to work twice as hard to prove everything. I have to shut down your stereotypes and all that other stuff. Yeah, I think we need to just work harder at, oh, another student mm -hmm. without 
the labels there that uh, that come about that way. Jen, any last thoughts? I really appreciate you guys being on our show and sharing really what your experiences have been like. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Talking Point Radio, you're listening to. Today we talked about the race card with uh, not quite the depth I wanted to get into, not quite the time either. We started our show a little late today. You can join the conversation on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash TalkingPointSUL, where you can uh, comment there. I'm going to put up a, a, a link or two, um, especially dealing with uh, I2M NYU, their campaign. I think that's something maybe we uh, probably ought to be doing here at DSU. And you can also join the conversation on our Twitter feed at, uh, at the hashtag TP Race Card. You can hear rebroadcast of the show Friday at 6 p.m. or go online and, and find podcasts for that there. On behalf of Jennifer Kohler and our guests, we wish you a great Wednesday afternoon. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Talking Point with the talk you avoid at the dinner table, but the topics that blow up on Facebook. Join the conversation on Twitter and Facebook at Talking Point SUL. Join us next Wednesday at 2 for more Talking Point with Jennifer Kohler and Eric Young.